الفتن صلوات الله البر الرحيم والملائكة المقربين على سيدنا محمد الصادق الوعد الأمين لله تعالى have the good intentions let's start talking about the recipients of the zakah there are eight types of people who can receive the zakah they are mentioned in surah tawbah قال الله تعالى إن الصدقات للفقراء والمساكين والعاملين عليها والمؤلفة قلوبهم والمؤلفة قلوبهم وفي الرقاب والغارمين وفي سبيل الله وبن السبيل. And we're going to mention these eight, these eight types now. The zakah is paid for whoever is found in the town of zakah. This means the zakah is, you pay the zakah to the people of the town, the town you are in. That is, don't take your zakah to another town. That town has its own zakah. You pay the zakah for the people of your town. And those are, among, those are, among them are the impoverished, the fuqara. Fuqara is the plural of faqir. He is the one who doesn't have what fulfills his needs. That is, he cannot even find half of his daily needs. If he needed $10 per day, he couldn't find five. This one is called faqir. And the masakeen, those are the needy, which is the plural of miskeen. And he's the one who has something to fulfill his needs, but he cannot find all of what he needs. His situation is not as severe as the case of the faqir. Both of those types receive the zakah. They're, they are eligible for zakah. The Khalifa would give that person whatever he needs to make money. Like, it means, does he have a trade? He knows how to do a job. He knows a trade. Then the zakah, then the Khalifa will give him from the zakah money what he needs to start a business so he can make his own money. If he doesn't have any trade, he doesn't have any skill, then the Khalifa will give him, will, for example, will buy land for him and buy uh, property for him and rent it out for him so that he can make money. Let's say, for example, he has a mental problem. Can't make any money. If he's old man and he's poor, the Khalifa will give him enough money for a year. Then if he's still alive and he's poor, he'll give him another, another amount for a year. Every year until he dies or until he stops being poor. Zakah money. Zakah money. Yes. If he's an old man, an old person, the Khalifa would give him enough money for a year. Also, the zakah workers, al-amiluna alayha, those who are appointed by the Khalifa to work in the zakah, and they don't take a salary. They can take from the zakah, whether they are among the people who collect the zakah, or the people who distribute the zakah, or the people who weigh the zakah, or count the zakah, because the Khalifa, what he'll do, inshallah ta'ala, is basically establish a zakah department. So the Khalifa would establish a zakah department, if you want, that's my own words. He established a zakah department, that means he assigns people who work in zakah, and they keep records and everything, and they collect zakah, and they, they have a land where they put the animals that they collected for zakah, and they have space where they put the money, put the gold or the, the crops or the, the raisins and dates and things like that. And then they distribute the zakah. They count it and they measure it and, and like this. So those who work, those who are zakah workers and they don't take a salary, then the khalifa, um, then they are eligible for, for receiving zakah. Not a person who appointed himself to collect the zakah, even if he does that properly, even if he does that properly, he collects the zakah and distributes it correctly, he doesn't, he's not eligible for the zakah. And those whose hearts need to be reconciled, al-mu'allafatu kulubuhum, like those who embraced Islam recently and still and they still feel some diso disassociation from the Muslims. Their hearts have not unified with the Muslims. 
so they can get zakah, so that they can feel better, feel more comfortable with the Muslims. Our Shaykh Nizar used to say, Ad-Darahim Marahim. That means money is like medicine cream, makes people feel better. <laughs> MashaAllah. And the slaves who wish to buy their freedom, who wish to pur purchase their freedom, Abriqab, they are the slaves who have done what might be called a self-purchase contract. They purchase, they want to purchase their freedoms. It's called mukataba. They want to purchase their freedom from their masters. And then they can take zakah so that it would help them pay their masters the money that is, um, has been agreed upon. And the indebted, al mean those are the people who have debts and they don't have what they need to fulfill their current debts. Even if they got those debts by haram, however, they've repented and their repentance has shown up. Then they can take from the zakah to pay back that debt. And the volunteer fighters, fi sabilillah, they are the people who are not registered in the army. They're not registered in the Muslim army. That means they're not paid soldiers. They're people who just want to fight. Lillahi ta'ala. There's an army going out, for example, and they want to join, and they're not registered soldiers. And fi sabilillah, in this case, does not mean any good deed, as some people have erroneously imagined. And that's against the consensus. Fi sabilillah, in the religious terminology, if there's nothing to specify its meaning, it means those who fight for the sake of Allah. And the stranded travelers, Ibn Sabil, like those who are stuck in the town of Zakah, and they don't have what they need to reach their destination, even if he's rich in his own town, but now he's, he's, he, run out of, he ran out of money. And it is not permissible to be paid to other than these types. Zakah cannot be paid to other than these. So whoever pays it to anyone other than these eight categories that are mentioned in the Quran, his zakah is not valid and he still has to pay it. Any question? Yes. The what? At-Tawbah. The author said, chapter of fasting. Fasting the month of Ramadan is obligatory by any of five matters. One, completing 30 days of Sha'ban. Two, seeing the crescent. And that's in reference to the one who saw it himself. Whoever saw the crescent himself, then he will fast the next day. Doesn't matter what his status is, meaning if it's a woman who saw the crescent, if he's a big sinner who saw the crescent, that doesn't matter. Because he saw the crescent. So even if he was a major sinner. And the confirmation, three, the confirmation that it was seen in reference to the one who didn't see it. And that confirmation would be by the testimony of someone trustworthy. So if it is confirmed for the Muslim judge that the, the crescent has been seen, but the person himself who heard that confirmation didn't see it, then he will fast. Like for someone to testify to the Muslim judge, someone whose testimony is acceptable, to testify to the Muslim judge that he saw the crescent, and then the Muslim judge would put out the word that the crescent has been sighted. And so, for example, they light the cannons, they ignite the cannons, or they light fires on top of the mountains, for example, or they, they beat the, uh, the big drums, or, or something like that, to make the Muslims know that the sighting has been confirmed. Now, in this case, this is, the, this is the case when it depends on who saw it. Was it a trustworthy Muslim male who saw it? Then the judge will take his word and, and spread it to the Muslims. In the first case, for the one who saw it himself, it doesn't matter what is his status. It, even if he's not a trustworthy Muslim male, because he saw the crescent. So he fasts, even if his word won't be enough for the other Muslims to fast for being informed by someone whom one believes is truthful. 
whether this person was a truck was trustworthy or a major sinner male or female and even if this person did not testify to the judge about his sighting it means if someone told you he saw the crescent and you believe him then you fast the next day even if he was a sinner even if it was a woman but that's not enough for the judge to spread that among the people being informed by someone whom one believes is truthful. And five, a determination by the likes of a prisoner, meaning a person make, makes ijtihad. So, for example, he's in a prison. He's locked away in a basement somewhere. He can't see the day or the night. He can't see outside. So he makes some determination somehow to determine that Ramadan is in, so he starts fasting. Or, for example, he's in a place where the sun doesn't rise every day. And he doesn't know for sure, 100%, what day is it. So he makes a determination. If his determination leads him to that Ramadan is in, then he fasts Ramadan. Any question? The author said section. The conditions for the validity of fasting are four things. Islam. One, Islam. So it's not valid from a blasphemer. Two, sanity. So it's not valid from a crazy person, an insane person. Three, purity from the likes of menstruation. So fasting is not valid from a menstruating or a postpartum bleeding woman. Four, and knowledge that the time is an acceptable time for fasting. So it's not valid to fast on a day when one is doubting whether it's a day of Ramadan or not. It's not permissible to fast on the day when one is not sure is it Ramadan or it's not Ramadan. The Messenger of Allah forbade that. That's called Yawm al-Shek. That's the day when there's rumors that the crescent has been sighted and no one trustworthy spotted that. There's no word from the judge about that. But people are talking about the crescent being sighted. And so it's not certain. It, was the crescent sighted or not? In this case, it's not permissible to fast the next day. It's not permissible. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا تقدموا رمضان بيوم أو يومين سوموا لرؤيته وأفطروا لرؤيته It means don't fast Ramadan by a day or two early. Don't advance Ramadan by a day or two. It means don't fast out of precaution. سُومُوا لِرُؤْيَتِهِ Fast upon seeing the crescent وَأَفْطِرُوا لِرُؤْيَتِهِ and, and break your fast upon seeing the crescent. فَإِنْ غُمَّ عَلَيْكُمْ فَأَكْمِلُوا عِدَّةَ تَشَعْبَانَ ثَلَاثِينَ if, you, if you're blocked from seeing the crescent because it's cloudy, for example, then complete 30 days of Sha'ban. Any question? The author said, section, and the conditions of its obligation are four things. One, Islam. So it is not obligatory on a blasphemer in a way that he is requested to perform it in the present life, even if he is addressed with it for torture in the afterlife. What this means is, it's not obligatory. It's, it means that we are not obligated to command the kafir to fast. We don't tell the Kafir to fast. Now, is he commanded to fast? He is commanded to fast, but he's commanded to fulfill a condition first, which is to become a Muslim. So he's commanded to become a Muslim first and then fast. So, as so that command is from Allah Ta'ala. As long as he's a Kafir, we don't command him to fast. We can command him, we can say, become a Muslim and then fast. But we don't say to him while he's a Kafir, fast. Because it's not valid. And he's addressed with that so that he would be tortured in the hereafter for not doing it. Because Allah wa ta'ala, he addresses his slaves so that they won't have any evidence in the hereafter for not obeying. Allah ta'ala said in Surah Taha, this ayah means, had Allah devastated them with a torture before they ever did anything, had Allah Ta'ala just put them in hell and tortured them before 
putting them in, in the earth so that they could do good deeds or bad deeds. Had he just created them and tortured them immediately, then they would have said, Oh, our Lord, if only you had sent a messenger to us so that we could follow him before we were degraded, before you tortured us. So, this means Allah Ta'ala sent messengers, and those messengers came, and they gave the warning. So then in the hereafter, no one will be able to say, Oh, Allah, had only you sent us a messenger. So those people are commanded, they are addressed. Allah wa Ta'ala commands them to pray, to, to believe, and to pray, and to fast, and to pay the zakah. But he made all those other things secondary to belief. The belief is the, is the primary obligation and the condition for the other obligations. If they don't believe, they'll be accountable for not believing and they'll be accountable for not doing the other obligations because they were able to believe and then do those obligations. And Allah sent a messenger to warn them. Two is accountability. So it is not obligatory on someone who's not accountable. So a child is not obligated to fast, and a crazy person is not obligated to fast. Three is the ability to withstand fasting. So it is not obligatory on one who cannot bear fasting due to sickness or old age. Those are the two excuses uh, for the one who, those are the two cases for the one who cannot fast. Either he's sick or he's old. And then sickness has two cases. Either it's uh, a sickness that he has no hope for cure, or it's a sickness that he has hope for cure. Like he's sick and he thinks that he's going to eventually get well, but he's just sick now and he can't fast. This has its rules. Or he's sick and he has no hope to ever be cured from this sickness. And this has its rules. Four, residents. So it is not obligatory on a traveler. Except the traveler who initiated his travel after the dawn has set in. So it is not permissible for him to break his fast on that day. So we said residence. Being a resident makes it obligatory on a person to fast. And if it's obligatory on the resident to fast, then it's obligatory on who? The citizen. Then for sure the citizen has to fast. The, the, the citizen has to fast and the resident has to fast and the traveler does not have to fast unless the traveler embarked on his travel after the dawn set in. That means he started fasting and then he traveled so now he can't break his fast according to a shafiri He needs to complete that day and if he's still fasting the next day he doesn't have to break his, he doesn't have to fast. Any question? I'm sorry? If he reached his destination, then how long is he going to stay there? Then he's still a traveler. The traveler is allowed to break his fast. Either he embarks on his travel before the dawn ever comes in, so that when the dawn comes in, he'll be a traveler, so he won't have to fast, or if he starts his travel after the dawn came in, then he needs to at least complete that day. And then the next day he can break his fast while he's a traveler. Yes. If, for example, now, let's say if it were Ramadan today, now, and the sun is still up, and he's fasting, and then he's traveled, then he has to complete this day. Then the sun goes down, and, and then the next dawn comes in, and he's a traveler. He doesn't have to fast that day. As long as he's a traveler. As long as the status of, a, of being a traveler is confirmed for him, he has all the permissions and facilities of a traveler. So he can shorten and combine his prayers, he can break his fast, he can wipe his khuf for three days, he can skip Jumu'ah. Yes. Yes, for sure. He has to make them up. I don't know the ayah. It's towards the end of the surah. 
سورة طه آمين وفيكم يس I don't know. I haven't learned any details about this case. The author said section. Section. Its integrals are two. One, the intention of fasting the following day of Ramadan at night, that is, makes the intention at night. And two, abandoning anything that breaks a fast. Leaving out anything that would interrupt the fast, such as inserting a mass that means something that takes up space into the body cavity through an open inlet. Inserting a mass, something that takes up space, like smoke, like a sesame seed, into the body cavity, like the lungs, the stomach, the bladder through an open inlet like the mouth, the nose, the private parts. This will invalidate the fast. And sexual intercourse invalidates the fast. And masturbation that caused ejaculation will invalidate the fast. If the person ejaculated, it will invalidate the fast. And swallowing saliva that's contaminated with filth or saliva that's been changed by something also invalidates the fast. While the person is mindful about that. Not that he forgot he was fasting. If he forgot he was fasting, then all of that doesn't break his fast. If he forgot. Why? Because fasting doesn't have any special words and it doesn't have any special moves. And so forgetting that one is fasting is not far-fetched. Since it's not far-fetched that a person could forget that he's fasting, then for him to forget that he's fasting and then commit any of these will not invalidate his fast. That's different from prayer, for example. It's far-fetched that the person would forget that he's praying to the extent that he eat a whole hamburger and drink a, drink a bottle of soda, for example, because the fast, the prayer has words and it has moves. So, he, sure, he might forget for a moment that he was praying, but for a long time, that's far-fetched. And for him to eat a big meal while he's praying because he forgot he was praying is far-fetched. So even if it really happened, it's not an excuse. But for fasting, it's not far-fetched that the person would forget he's fasting because there's no special move or, and there's no special word to remind him that he's fasting. And he was willing to do those things. No one forced him. If he, if he did those things willingly, he broke his fast. He was mindful and, and willing, choosing that, not forced. And he wasn't ex an excused ignorant person. Like a person who recently embraced Islam, and he didn't know that eating breaks his fast. And he didn't know, for example, that sexual intercourse breaks his fast. Then his fast won't be broken. It is obligatory to make up the fast of whoever corrupted his fast on a day of Ramadan immediately after the Eid if he broke his fast sinfully. Whoever broke his fast sinfully is obligated to make it up immediately after the Eid. And whoever broke his fast with an excuse is allowed to delay making it up. However, it must be made up before the next Ramadan comes. Furthermore, if a person broke his fast by sexual intercourse, then, and he had no excuse to do that, no facility, no permission to do that, like he wasn't a traveler, so he broke his fast by sexual intercourse with no excuse, then not only he has to make it up, he needs to pay, he needs to fulfill an expiation, the kafara, to free a Muslim slave, or to fast for two consecutive months, or to feed 60 poor Muslims. Any question?
Yes. The sexual intercourse, I have nothing to do with the, like, the masturbate or something. No, two different cases. The author said, yes. So the person has a, a, a wet dream in the day, uh, and then they wake up and they see, uh, and they see, uh, and they see like, would that invalidate their ass? No. The author said, section, fasting is invalidated by apostasy. If that apostasy happened during the daytime, it will break the fast. And menstruation and postpartum bleeding and childbirth, if a woman was fasting and then during the daytime she menstruated or her postpartum bleeding started or she delivered her baby, she was fasting while she was pregnant and then she delivered her baby during the daytime, it breaks her fast and insanity for even a mere moment if a person lost his mind during the daytime it will break his fast and fainting for the entire day being unconscious by fainting for the entire day that means he was unconscious before Fedra came in and he didn't wake up until after Mufra came in then this day is not valid if he woke up for even a moment then that day is valid Or he lost his mind because of insan because of drunkenness. And and that insanity that was a result of his drunkenness lasted all day from before Fajr until after Maghrib, then this fast is not valid. Any question? Yes. This will not invalidate his fast. It's still valid. Yes. Yes. If a person lost his mind because of drunkenness, and he was insane all day, meaning from before Fajr until after Maghrib, with no moment of sanity, then this day is not valid. Yes. If he fainted, so he was unconscious due to fainting, not due to sleeping, and he was unconscious all day, that means before Fajr, until after Maghrib, then this day is not valid. If he woke up for even a moment during the daytime, that fast would be valid. Of course, as long as he made his intention in the nighttime. Yes. Fainting or the insanity due to drunkenness. Yeah, if he slept all day and didn't wake up for one moment, his fast is valid. And what? When? So he made his intention during the night before. Then he started fasting in the daytime. And then something happened and he, he lost his consciousness. His fast is valid. For that day, because if he stayed unconscious, then how can he make his intention? That's outside of Shafi'i school. According to a Shafi'i, that's not valid. The author said, chapter of Hajj, performing the Hajj and the Umrah once in a lifetime is an obligation upon the pubescent Muslim. So it's not obligatory on the child. And if the child performs it, then when he becomes pubescent, he needs to do an obligatory one. And it's not obligatory on a crazy person, but if a crazy person's guardian took him to the Hajj and performed the acts of Hajj for him 
and made wudu on his organs and took him around the Kaaba, then this is counted as a sunnah for him out of the generosity of Allah. And when he gains his sanity, he has to do an obligatory one. And it's obligatory on the free person. So if a slave did the hajj or the umrah, then he gains his freedom. He has to do an obligatory one. And whoever can do it himself is not allowed to let another person do it for him. Whoever can perform the hajj on his own is not allowed to let another person do it for him. Who's a person who can't do it himself? Like if he's bedridden, he's sick, he can't get out of bed. Or like, for example, he's an old man, he can't even stay on the horse. He can't stay in the ride. He can't even stay in the car, for example. Maybe he can't even stay in the car. Can't get in. He can't take the long ride. He can't go. Then someone can do it for him on his behalf. And if he can't do it, and, and someone volunteers to do it for him, and that one already did his own, then he's obligated to accept. He has to accept. And if he's able to hire a person to do it for him, then he's obligated to. The one who can't do it by himself, then either he'll pay someone to do it or not. The one who volunteers to do it for him, then this one, if he already did his own hajj, he's obligated to accept. And if he can pay someone, then he's obligated to pay that one. No. At the same time? No. Yes? The one that can afford to go and does not go every year that he doesn't go not according to the Shafi'i uh, school. If the, a person is able to go, but he doesn't go, according to a Shafi'i, the obligation of Hajj is bitarakhi. That means it's a delayable obligation. But, he has, but once he becomes able, he's obligated to do it before he dies. If he becomes able, and then he delays it, and he dies before performing it, then upon death, a major sin will be written for him. Yes? Yes, you can do hajj on behalf of the dead person. In fact, if a person dies and he leaves money, then we're going to take his money and pay his debts. And then if he has money left over, also we're going to buy his shrouds for him. And among what we're going to do with his money is we're going to give it to someone who will make hajj for him if he was able to do it during his lifetime. This is for the one who was able to do it during his lifetime, but he didn't. We'll take from his money and pay someone to go and do it. On? It's, it's, an, it's obligation. Uh, it's obligatory on um, his heirs or whoever is in charge of the money that he left behind. To take that, to take some money, if there's any remaining, to, and, and pay someone to perform hajj on his behalf, if he was able to do it while he was alive and didn't do it. Yes? Can I explain about the one who volunteers? For example, you went to someone and said, I'll do hajj for you. Yeah, if, if the one who volunteers to make the hajj for him has already done his own hajj and this one is unable to do it by himself so someone came and volunteered to do it without, without any salary so it's a volunteer, it's voluntary so he's not allowed to say no I don't accept yes, yes. I don't know. MashaAllah. Yes? Yes. 
According to Ash-Shafi'i, the Hajj and the Umrah are obligatory. Allah said, وَأَتِمُّ الْحَجَّ وَالْعُمْرَةَ لِلَّهِ It means perform the Hajj and the Umrah. So Ash-Shafi'i understood from that that both of them are obligatory. But that's not a matter of consensus. The intervals of Hajj are five. The Ihram, so for the person to make the intention to enter into the state of Ihram, he has to do that at a certain time and before he reaches a certain spot. He has to, if he wants to make Ihram for Hajj, there's a certain time for it and he has to make sure he does it before he reaches a certain before he passes a certain point. Which we'll come back to that, inshallah. Once he gets into the state of ihram, then some things are going to be haram for him until he gets back out of ihram. That's why it's called ihram. Because once he enters into that state, there are things that will become haram for him that are not normally haram. Two is standing at Arafah, and the standing is not actually a condition. Being there, being at any part of Arafah, even for a moment, is an integral of the Hajj. If a person misses Arafah, he missed the whole Hajj. His Hajj won't be valid. He can't. He doesn't have a valid Hajj. And the time of Arafah is from the declination of the sun on the ninth of Dhul Hijjah until Fajr. So there's a month called Dhul Hijjah. Then uh, the Eid is the tenth. The Eid is the tenth of Dhul Hijjah. Eid al Adha, the Eid that comes at Hajj time. There's two Eids. There's Eid after Ramadan and there's Eid and Eid at the Hajj season. The Eid at the Hajj season is the tenth of Dhul Hijjah. The time for Arafah is from the 9th of Dhul Hijjah until Fajr. Which means until the Fajr of the Eid, the 10th of Dhul Hijjah. You know in our religion, the night comes before the day. The night comes before the day. When the sun goes down, the day is over and the new day starts with the night time. Don't, don't we count the first night of Ramadan when, the, when we spot the moon? It's the first night of Ramadan. And then the next day is the first day of Ramadan. And then that next night is the second night of Ramadan, and then the second day, and then the third night, and then the third day, like that. The night comes before the day. So, the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, it starts when the sun goes down. Then, so that's Maghrib, of the ninth of Dhul Hijjah. Then Isha, for the ninth of Dhul Hijjah. Then Fajr, for the ninth of Dhul Hijjah. The sun will rise on the ninth of Dhul Hijjah and reach its zenith. Then when the sun moves out of the zenith and goes into the west, that means Dhuhr started, on the 9th of Dhul Hijjah, this is when the time of Arafah starts. And he needs to be at Arafah for even one moment from that time all the way until Fajr time. So he can be there Dhuhr time, Asr time, Maghrib time, Isha time, until Fajr time. Three is circling the Kaaba after being at Arafah. Seven laps, each lap starting at the black stone, which is at one of the corners of the Kaaba, while the person keeps the Kaaba on his left side. He keeps the Kaaba on his left side and walks forward. Four, the striving, a sai, which is going between Al Safa and Al Marwa, these two protrusions. There's two mountains. These two mountains, each one has a protrusion, something sticking out of it. So the person has to go between these two protrusions seven times. And making sa'i in the new lane that they've built in recent years is invalid because it's outside of the mas'a, it's outside of the place of sa'i. Imagine a person says, ah, let's make tawaf around uh, something else. It's too crowded at the Kaaba. Or imagine someone says, 
Oh, uh, we, have, we don't have enough space here. Let's just pray without suju, without suju, so we can stand closer and make more space. That's unacceptable. Likewise, that's what they did. They said, "Oh, it's so crowded. Let's make a new lane outside of the proper area." And then they did that. The one who makes sa'i in that new lane, his sa'i is not valid. Five, shaving all of the head for a man or trimming his hair and trimming for a woman, not shaving for a woman. So shaving or trimming. But for a woman, she doesn't shave. Shave means bald. Any question? Yes. Yes. Trimming means at least three hairs. Yes? No. You're not obligated to support anyone but the people that Allah made it obligatory to support. You have to support your wife, your children until they reach puberty. You have to support your poor Muslim parents. Like that, you don't have to support your brothers and sisters, your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, let alone strangers. You're not obligated to. You can if you want, but you're not obligated to. Yes? No, he doesn't have to pay for her hajj. No. Maybe she has her own money. Yeah, if she can afford it, then she has to make she has to make Hajj. She has her own money. He doesn't have to pay for her Hajj. If he won't if he won't go with her, then she can hire someone to uh, one of her relatives to go with her if he won't go for free. If if they won't go even for a salary, then she can go with three other women or two other women. Or she can even go alone, but not in these days, meaning the Wahhabis won't let her in if she goes without a mahram. So, mashallah. Yes? Yeah, if he dies uh, after he was able to do it, then, and, and without doing it, then upon death a major sin will be written against him. Once she became able to go, she became able to go. If she dies without performing the Hajj, she'll have a major sin written against her on death, upon death. Yes? No, their children are obligated to, to support them. Ami wa fikum. Let's stop here, inshallah ta'ala. You can ask me if you want more, but we'll stop here. Then tomorrow, the schedule is mentioned for tomorrow, so we'll go from 10 to 5 tomorrow. Inshallah, it won't be uh, uh, infringing on anyone's time. It's, it's, a, it's a very good deed. And we'll be able, we'll, we're, we're on like page 30.